Amy barely needs an introduction because so many of you know her and work with her, but she deserves it because she does such great work. So I'm going to just tell you a little bit about Amy. She's worked in public horticulture fields since 1996, received her bachelor's degree in ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of California, Irvine, and went on to study plant-animal interactions at the University of Michigan. Her master's thesis concerned the effects of invasive weeds on pollinator-plant relationships. And she currently leads the initiatives at the Butterflies Pavilion, the local pollinator habitat initiatives. Many of them you have worked on, the Baseline Pollinator District, Manitou Springs Pollinator District, and the Urban Prairies Project. And Amy always has such a unique take. You're really going to enjoy this. Thanks. Thanks, Joyce. Uh, the first thing I want to say is I had the honor of actually visiting the garden that Dr. Patch was talking about earlier this year. And if you ever get a chance to, to go see it, I highly recommend it. It's such an educational and wonderful experience to see that garden. Um, but I'm going to speak from more of the horticulturist point of view, but a horticulturist that is an incredible bug nerd. That's maybe the first thing you should know about me. Um, oh, there we go. Two. So we're here to celebrate pollinators today, and I want to start, I've been in this field a long time. I mean, I'm old, y'all. So I have, I started at the Butterfly Pavilion back when people would ask me the question, how do I attract butterflies but not bees, like that long ago. <laughs> and now, of course, I have seen sort of the ripple effects where it used to be people would ask me questions about only butterflies. And then people started asking me questions about honeybees, and now people are asking me about native bees. And it's very exciting because I think that there is an awesome opportunity to expand our concept of beneficial biodiversity. I will say I come from a place called Butterfly Pavilion. We are an invertebrate zoo. We wouldn't get the visitation we get if we were called the Earwig Pavilion, right? <laughs> but, but I'm... I'm open to it. I'm open to it. So I'm going to build a bit on Dr. Patch's talk because not only do we want to think about biodiversity in terms of floral visitation, but then you add a whole nother layer because not only are you dealing with beetles and flies and butterflies and moths and wasps and all these things that pollinate, you're also dealing with complex metamorphosis, which basically doubles or quadruples all of the needs that a habitat has to provide. So even though when we look at pictures of pollinators, it's usually like, oh, pollinators, let's look at a fuzzy bumblebee on a flower. It's like, oh, let's look at a maggot in the muck, and then we'll really talk pollinators. So my main theme for today is really thinking about how do we make habitat as inclusive as possible for our invertebrate friends? Uh, we have to think of what are the limiting resources for these animals? Sometimes that's going to be flowers, but sometimes that might be reproductive resources or water in this part of the, of the country. Thinking about life cycles and how that plays into your garden or your habitat that you're working on. And finally, thinking about how increasing that biodiversity actually supports a lot of other wildlife species. So we have some incredible presenters coming up uh, to talk about wasps and moths. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that because I don't want to steal anyone's thunder, but I am going to start with one of my favorite group of pollinators, the beetles. Yeah, the beetles. <laughs> so um, there's a myth about, I'm going to kind of start with a little myth, and the myth about beetles is if it's not a ladybug, it's out to eat my garden. That's, that's kind of like the first thing. And it makes sense because most beetles have chewing mouth parts, and they evolve to chew pollen. So of course they're going to be chewing on things because that's what they do, but they are incredible pollinators. Um, and really, especially in the late season here in this part of Colorado, we see a lot of beetle diversity on our plants. And so I'm just going to do brief profiles of some of the ones that are maybe a little more common, things you might find in your own habitat. And this first one, of course, is our bumbleflower beetles. I think they look like miniature bears. Um, they're very cute. They've got fuzzy little butts like, 
like you see in the picture. Um, they are part of the scarab family, and they often aggregate when they're feeding on sap or nectar, and so people associate them with plant diseases. They're like, oh, those beetles, they're going to spread some sort of disease. That's very, very rare. And actually, they pollinate a lot of things like sunflowers, or as you see, this one is on a narrow-leafed cone flower. Um, and you tend to see these guys in midsummer. And then, of course, you have one of my favorites, the soldier beetles, brightly colored because they are able to sequester all sorts of toxins. They are sending a message. They are not very good to eat. Um, but the reason why they are my favorite is I like to call these guys the date and mate. Uh, uh, pollinators, because when they pollinate, they're usually mating also, so it's like dinner in a movie, but you know, <laughs> Netflix and chill, maybe a little bit. Uh, and these guys, because of their life cycle, they are more at the end of the season. So when the rabbit brush is blooming, you can see sometimes hundreds of them over stands of dwarf rabbit brush, tall rabbit brush. Um, and, and so they are something that we see a lot of in this part of Colorado. And then finally, our blister beetles. And we have a lot of those here in Colorado as well. And they also have the ability to defend themselves uh, with secondary chemical compounds. And again, they really like those asters. Right? They have soft bodies. Um, don't squish them. Don't eat them. Just my. Um, but beyond that, we have other beetles that visit flowers, such as our longhorn beetles, which uh, start off as borers and then become pollinators in their adult. Um, adult life. We have lady beetles, which are predators, but also visit flowers a lot of the time. So something to think about in the biology of beetles is that Beetles serve multiple garden roles. So that myth about, oh, they're all out to eat my plants, well, some of them are out to eat your plants. But um, in another part of their life, they may be a pollinator. Many of them, because of the way our spring can be really unpredictable and often very cold, we don't really see the beetles start to get very active until mid to late se season. They also aren't great flyers. You're not gonna see beetles traveling thousands of miles to get to Mexico. <laughs> That would be hilarious, but they're not good at it. Um, because of that elytra that they have, they just kind of, they're like vertical. They're like a little like helicopter that just kind of like, like this when they fly. And they have that small mouth parts. So thinking about that in terms of general habitat guidance, you can translate that into some habitat tips. So a, a garden that's great for our local beetles is going to include late blooming flowers, uh, especially those in the aster family seem to be very attractive to many of our beetles, but certainly not just the asters. Um, ensuring that there's access to the soil because we heard about ground nesting bees from Dr. Patch, but it turns out many of our beetles also pupate in the soil. And so if you disturb your soil a lot, if you're constantly tilling it, or if you're covering it with landscape fa fabric, you're not gonna get that full life cycle that the beetles need. And then making sure that there's some debris um, overwintering in your garden. Again, for those beetles um, to complete their life cycles. Those are just some, some tips, general tips to help you think about creating a beetle garden. Um, and I have to also say, Dr. Patch is the only person that has, along with me, said we need to design fly gardens. And so I really appreciated him talking about that in his talk. Um, so what is the myth about flies? They like poop. They're gross. They care, you know, they're going to make me sick. All of those kinds of things. I think we're starting to get a little bit more interest in flies because we do have some really beautiful ones. Um, so. Of course, one of the major families of pollinating flies is the surfid family. And there are a couple of subfamilies that we see quite often here in Colorado, and they are bee mimics, right? So a lot of times when people say, oh, there, there's a bee, and they, they start to get maybe a little concerned, you can say, well, you don't have to worry a thing about that. He's striped like a bee, but he's not going to do anything to you. Um, but why mimic a bee? Well, who's going to mess with you, right? Um, they tend to really go for things in the carrot family, in the sunflower family, and they're really good flyers. They can hover, they can um, maneuver very well. And then you have your drone flies, which also are bee mimics. These guys actually sound like bees sometimes, so they really, they really trick people. Uh, but if you look for those big, bulbous eyes, that's always a giveaway. And of course, they only have one pair of wings instead of two. And for drone flies, in their life cycle, they actually need 
semi-aquatic habitats in order to complete their life cycle. So if you've ever heard the phrase rat-tailed maggot, which I think uh, someone needs to call it band name, rat the rat-tailed maggots, right? Um, you're, you're Gonna, you're gonna have those drone flies around. And I'm not saying everyone needs to have standing water. You probably don't want standing water in your, directly in a backyard or somewhere like that. But if there is semi-aquatic habitat nearby and you provide the nectar and pollen that they need, you're more likely to see these wonderful drone flies. Um, the other thing about the, both the hoverflies and the drone flies is their larvae are very predaceous. Um, I feel like someone needs to make a horror movie of like giant maggots because they are terrifying. <laughs> they have like hook mouths and they're really something. Um, and then you have your bombolids, which is a different family of flies. They're like flying puffballs. Um, and I've actually seen a lot of pictures of them on Pinterest, so I think they're going to be the next hot pollinator. That's my prediction. Uh, but they are hairy, uh, and they, a lot of times they'll have like pigmented wings. Um, and they are, tend to be, for us, very late in the season. Um, they really do come out with that last flush of uh, white heath aster or our tansy asters. They really come out later in the season. They often are parasitoids on other um, insects, so grasshoppers, sometimes bees. Um, but if you have biodiversity, your bees can handle a little parasitoidism, so it's all good. Um, and then we have the pollinator that we dare not speak its name, male mosquitoes. <laughs> I had to put this picture because this, this mosquito is loaded with pollen. Um, Tachinid flies, which uh, are also parasitoid flies, they have big bristly butts, so you can tell them apart. And soldier flies, which are named because they have very bold, like militaristic markings. Um, all of these are flies that we can see here in our gardens here in Colorado. Um, and we need to think about what their natural history is like so we can really have that life cycle that supports their full. Um, life cycle. So making sure for them, some of them come out very early, some of them extend late into the season, so really making sure you have that seasonal diversity. Keeping in mind that most, most flies do have smaller tongues than bees and butterflies, and also appreciating their impact for pest control services. So eating things like from aphids to other, um, other garden pests. Um, so making sure that you allow them to do that work and, and don't maybe use things like chemical pesticides that can interfere with their ability to help you. Um, and what, a lot of what we're learning now is even things like herbicides, when there's runoff that gets into aquatic systems that can mess with the developmental biology of many of these insects that have aquatic parts of their life. So making sure that you're doing what you can to, to prevent runoff into our aquatic systems, making sure that you have you know, if you have that kind of moist random place in and, and the landscape you manage that you're like, oh, it's always kind of moist here. Well, that might be a place where flies are actually laying their eggs and it might be very valuable. Um, ensuring that you have blooms from early till late. And then I'm gonna talk about this more in depth later. And it kind of ties into what Dr. Patch said, but allowing some mess, right? So. We're gonna talk about the problems of being too sterile in your landscape, but for these animals to find their niche, a little bit of chaos is a good thing. So if you have a little bit of mess, um, think about, oh, well, that's for the flies. <laughs> so I'm not gonna to talk too much about moths because I know Pam is gonna talk about it, but I did wanna talk about the fact that when we talk about moths and butterflies and Lepidoptera, Butterflies only make about 10% of that whole order. Everything else is a moth. So we don't know that much about them, and they are wildly varying. Like if you read the literature, like some people say, well, 1% of moths are pollinators, and other people say, well, 33% of moths are pollinators. The field is out there. We need to learn more. But they, you know, people think of moths as nocturnal. They're not mysterious. We have a lot of day-flying moths, y'all, and they're, they're, they're busy. The main thing that we have seen, and I actually experienced this in, in captive populations at Butterfly Pavilion, is where mo uh, butterflies tend to be very specific about where they lay their eggs to have their young. Moths tend to be a little bit more generalistic. So if you've ever read the book, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, what does a caterpillar eat? He eats a lollipop. He eats a salami. <laughs> probably eats some, uh, I know he eats some leaves at some point, but anyway, he's a very generalist moth. He's eating a lot of different things, but they need that to, to 
grow from basically this, they would be the equivalent of a human baby growing to the size of a school bus. So uh, these moths really have to eat a lot to, to make it through their life cycle. Many of the moths, uh, not so much the pollinating one, pollinating moths, but many moths actually don't eat as adults. So uh, that's why moths have to eat so much generally. Um, but I'm not going to go into identifying moths or talking about their, their biology so much, but some things to think about is that moths usually spend a lot of time in their pupal stage. So making sure that you have places that are safe for moths to pupate, uh, having a wide range of hosts, and I have a resource at the end of this talk that is a great database if you're looking for, for information about those hosts. Understanding that moths can fly at day or fly at night, depending on the species, and that they tend to have longer tongues. So what does that mean for their habitat? Well, for one thing, for the night flying ones, and I know we have dark skies here, uh, the Dark Sky Association here today, but making sure to, if you can, advocate for dark skies where you live. And there's increasing amount of research that actually talks about how um, light pollution is interfering with day flying pollinators as well. So it's not just the moths that are suffering. Um, but the more that we can advocate for responsible lighting, the better for moths and better for other pollinators. Um, for those pollinators that are evening and nighttime pollinators, fragrance usually plays a big role in how they find those resources. So things like our desert four o'clocks um, are wonderful for things like hawk moths. Um, Tolerating a little chewing, having a higher damage threshold. So if you see things eating your plants, don't automatically assume that it's bad. It might be something that is part of the habitat and actually leading to a beneficial pollinator in the end. And then what I do personally is I have larger masses of host plants. So if there's a little bit of chewing, you hardly even see it. So you can do that too. And I'm going back to the soil again. The more soil disturbance, the less uh, these, many of these moths can pupate in the ground where they like to pupate. So um, reducing tillage, um, making sure that you are letting things pupate where they want to. All right, what's the myth about wasps? We're not, um, again, Eric's going to talk about those. They're the a-holes of the pollinator world. <laughs> uh, but as Dr. Patch said, Bees came from wasps. Bees are just the vegetarian versions. Um, and I think so much of our interactions with wasps is colored by interactions that we've had certain numbers of times with certain numbers of species, right? But there are hundreds of kinds of wasps here in Colorado, and some of them provide multiple garden uh, services, um, and many of them are quite docile or shy. I'll point out the tarantula hawk wasp right there. Uh, you know, on the Schmidt Sting Pain Index, it gets a four, but you know how hard you have to work to, to get it to sting you? It really doesn't want to sting you. It really doesn't. It needs that venom to find its spider host to lay its eggs in. Um, things like this prionix that's over here um, is a grasshopper parasitoid. So if you have a lot of grasshoppers, maybe too many grasshoppers, you kind of want that guy around. Um, but again, they don't have those long tongues like bees do. They serve multiple garden roles. Many of them are parasitoids or predators in the garden. Um, many of them are awesome flyers, and we tend to see them mid to late season, again, because it takes some time for their populations to build up in the landscape. So again, fitting the flowers to their mouth parts so that they tend to be small and shallow. Um, again, that sunflower and carrot family uh, tends to bring in a lot of them. Families tend to bring in a lot of them. Um, understanding that if you use pesticides, that that can in, uh, impact their insect prey that wasps need to feed their young. Uh, planting hardwood trees for things like our ichneumon wasps that uh, look for borers inside trees and, and lay eggs there. And then when you do have those negative interactions with wasps, really finding other ways to go about mitigating that negative impact. So making sure that you are managing nest building or scouting, finding out where they are. Sanitation is huge for things like yellow jackets. So those are just some of the profiles for some of the things you might see when you are out and about. Maybe not today, but soon, soon. Um, I'm saying that optimistically. <laughs> we'll see what the winter is like. Um, but now I just want to talk about how when, when Butterfly Pavilion works on habitat projects, some principles that we use to really think about all of these different orders and all of the different things that they need throughout their life cycles. So 
We kind of look at it both from the diversity piece, which I think uh, Dr. Patch really um, gave us a great overview and, and some great research and, and resources into how to think about that. We do absolutely think about families because plants are little chemical factories. That's what they do. They produce all sorts of secondary compounds, some of them quite heinous and some of them quite delightful. But uh, making sure to have family diversity, gen uh, genus diversity, and then also things like morphological diversity and seasonal diversity, it's very important. Um, but, the, but the next thing that I want to advocate for is structural complexity. So really thinking about, you know, I think when I first started at Butterfly Pavilion, a lot of butterfly gardens were like all your two to three foot and, uh, perennials all in a bed, right? Um, and now we're thinking, well, you've got to have some woodies in there. You've got to have some grasses. You've got to have some bare patches. You've got to have some, uh, you know, fallen logs or whatever it is, like really thinking about all the different ways that the landscape actually supports these life cycles. And then finally, thinking about how are these connected at the appropriate scale for the animals you're talking about. If you're talking about a flower bumble beetle, how far can that poor thing fly? Not very far. Or some of our smallest sweat bees, again, not, you know, a few hundred yards maybe, not very far. So this is a, a, just a diagram of some of the ways that many landscapes might be providing some various resources for various pollinators. And they include things like snags, right? Like how many people are like, I want a snag in my garden. Well, maybe it's a good idea to keep a snag if it's safe, right? As long as you can make it safe. Um, things like uh, making sure that there are some native flowers, um, shrubs, trees, access to water. Um, we noticed that a lot of our uh, bees actually nest in the banks alongside creeks and places like that. So when you can maintain the integrity of our waterways or drainages, that can be very beneficial. So I'm going to advocate for messiness right now. Um, and I've been a horticulture director at a like public zoo for over 20 years, and messiness is not usually that OK. But there are ways to make it OK, right? So how many landscapes have you seen in your town where it's like six Carl Forster reed, feather reed grass in a row, and then six Russian sage in a row, and it's all covered with landscape fabric, and then mulch? Isn't that like every Target parking lot, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. Um, and so that is a very sterile environment. And I think as our world changes, what we can do if we're really going to advocate for biodiversity is start saying we need a little bit more chaos in our landscapes, whether it's a, a, a store landscape or it's a, my own personal landscape or it's a natural area that's a part of my community. So thinking about how do things look over time and allowing for, you know, maybe things are going to look very dominated by grasses and perennials for those first few years, and then as the woodies take off, it's going to change. Um, and it's, it's good that it changes. You don't want it to be static forever. Um, thinking about scale. So maybe you're not going to get away with a whole bunch of mess, but you can get away with a corner of mess, or you can get away with the back 40 of mess, right? Um, there's another term that I really love that I talk about all the time with our partners that we work with is, uh, messy nature, orderly frames. And I'm sorry, I can't remember who originally said that, but it's brilliant. Because if you take mess and you frame it, all of a sudden, it looks intentional. You meant to do that. So the next time you start feeling bad about how your garden looks, just make a nice frame around it. And they're like, I meant to do that. Um, and then something that I think the role of mess can actually do for us as a community is as Dr. Patch said, do your own thing, right? So on the street I live, I have um, one of my favorite neighbors is the local plumber who does the big Halloween display. Um, and his yard has things for pollinators. He did not plant them. He did not plan to have those. But he's left some things that are really great just because he doesn't have the time to do anything else. And, and then you have me who's like, I've got my beautiful garden because I'm a horticulture director, right? And then you have everything in between. Um, and it's really made our neighborhood, because this summer I did this mapping project of my street, and it's really made my neighborhood kind of come together and say like, oh, we're all providing these different things. And so that's something that I think communities can, can do in their own way. 
um, and find meaning in it. Because when you see that wet, um, Bombus occidentalis, which I did for the first time ever this summer, um, that, like, that was enough to say, we must be doing something right in Old Town Arvada. Who knew? So something else to think about as we, you know, because reading the papers that are part of what Dr. Patch uh, provided, it's so useful and so educational. But I think that for many people, what they need are just like, what can I do right now, right? And, and how can I support the most? And so some of the plants like choke cherry, like rabbit brush, those are providing key resources to so many species in our landscape. Um, and so by, even if somebody can only plant a few plants, if they can plant a few things like this that are easily available and support a lot of, of species, we call those high habitat value plants. They're providing a lot of value and you don't have to have necessarily a full garden if that's something you can't do. And then of course there's the maintenance, which I think is the final frontier when it comes to talking about designing and planting pollinator gardens. It's something that a lot of people don't think about. Oh, I actually have to take care of this. Um, and so um, we do have a resource that we, um, Butterfly Pavilion, High Plains Environmental Center, CSU Extension, and Norris Design worked on a habitat-friendly maintenance guidelines document. Um, my email is at the end of this. And so if anybody wants access to that document, I'm happy to send it to you. Um, but really thinking about like, Garden, everything from garden cleanup to integrated pollinator and pest management and how to, um, how to incorporate that into your yearly maintenance. Um, I will say that something I love about working at Butterfly Pavilion as long as I have is we don't use pesticides in the gardens. We do see a lot of predators and a lot of parasitoids. And so we really have you know, I can barely, the only thing I can think about is Japanese beetles right now, that we started getting those this year. Um, but we do get rabbits, and we do get uh, smokers trying to burn down our garden. Uh, those are our pests right now. Um, but if you have that diversity, you are bringing in all the species that can kind of keep others in check. And the less you have your, your habitat dominated by one plant species, the less likely you're gonna see is like Aster Yellows takes out everything. You know, from a gardener perspective, diversity is good too. Oop, went too far, okay. Um, so my final thing is there are a lot of insects that visit flowers. Flowers are an incredible resource and they may not be pollinators, they may be predators of pollinators, or they may be like this little grasshopper who just wants to sit on a flower just because it's a nice place to sit. Um, so flowers are huge resources, and I think the, the, the increased awareness about pollinators and why they're so important to us is wonderful. It has opened up so much involvement and so much progress in conservation. But I think the next step is to really think about, well, there are a lot of species out there, and by really being mindful of all these life cycles and all these needs, um, we, and, and maybe over a landscape scale, we can really increase biodiversity as a whole. So uh, here are some uh, wonderful books, but I wanted to point out this website, the Hosts Database. It's from the Natural History Museum in the UK, and it's a worldwide database. So if you wanna know host plants for moths in Sumatra, you can do that. But if you also want to know about things that are, provide hosts, you can search by plant and you can search by uh, Lepidopteran. And it, will, it gives you a lot of information. So if you are curious about you know, what plants, what, what uh, poll pollinators or what moths and butterflies might be feeding on this particular plant, it's a great um, database. So with that, I have time for questions. Uh, is it really pessimistic of me to say too late? 
Um, so European paper wasp, that was a question about the European paper wasp. What should we do about that? Um, uh, Dr. Cranshaw, retired at CSU, uh, was very interested in the impact of EPW on our lepidopterans because they do feed their young caterpillars. And they were introduced to Colorado about in the 1990s, I believe. Um, and uh, in that time, Dr. Cranshaw posited that we have been seeing a decrease in caterpillars successfully growing up, right? We're seeing fewer uh, lepidopterans because of that. Um, I would say um, if you can limit their nest building, you know, so especially if you're trying to grow habitat for specifically butterflies and moths, a lot of times what we'll do is um, we will go out before sunrise or after sunset and scout for nests and if we see them we will clean the area with soap and water and you have to do that like over and over and over again because they will keep trying. Um, but we do limit their colonization if we are like intentionally trying to make habitat for those lepidopterans. We will just do that by managing where they build their nests. I, I do think that they're here. They're here to stay. I, I don't think we're going to get rid of them. Yeah. I'll repeat it. So at this point, we had, okay, so the question was, thank you for reminding me. The question was about Japanese beetle and, and what are sort of the, in terms of the management of it. Who here is dealing with Japanese beetle in their landscape? Oh, wow, yes, yes, that's really taken over. Um, so we are just in the early colonization stages at Butterfly Pavilion. So this past year, all we were doing was physical control, so basically, hand removing them and killing them. Uh, we'll see what happens next year. I think with any pest that people are concerned about, it is really good to look at all of your options, right? Say what all of your options are. It might, you know, look at BT, look at um, things like using cowling clay on the leaves of your grapevines or removing plants that are just Japanese beetle magnets and just saying goodbye um, to them, like looking at all your options and then it's going to have to be a customized situation. So that's part of what we do when we do integrated pest management. But then also thinking about the pollinator side of things, like how might these things impact pollinators. And the nice thing about things like BT is that's pretty specific. It's going to go after the Japanese beetle grub. But um, I think the best thing you can do is monitor and watch and like keep on it and be consistent with whatever uh, whatever tool you're using. Yeah. Eileen? I'll repeat the question this time, I promise. How are you meshing the genetic importance to maybe serving as a place for bugs? Well, uh, so the question was, how are we uh, messaging that a garden is a place for bugs at Butterfly Pavilion? Uh, that's a really good question. I feel like just going through the garden with people, like whenever we're working in the garden or walking in the garden with guests, we're just pointing out bugs like right and left. Because a lot of times people didn't even see them unless you actually show them off to people. And we saw some really cool things this past summer. So, um, so I think garden walks do a great thing. Uh, encouraging people to be active and iNaturalist in the garden is another really great way. I do fear that um, we are preaching to the choir a great deal. And that's kind of a big thing that I would love to work with community partners on is really thinking about, OK, well, we're reaching all the bug nerds, super. We've got to go beyond that. And I think one of the main ways is to emphasize that role in other wildlife as well, um, as well as all of the ecological services in terms of pest control. So people who are looking for pest control in their gardens, um, encouraging those beneficial insects to help them with that. So um, I think we can talk to other gardeners. We can talk to bird people. But 
really, like with kids, it's so easy because you get down on your hands and knees and find a woolly bear caterpillar and all of a sudden the kids ha are like, so it's like Christmas for them. Yeah. Uh, any more? One, more? One more? Okay, Andrea. Andrea asked if I could talk about Lepidoptera and cultivars. I think the main concern is that the secondary compounds in cultivars could be different. I don't know, I'm, I'll be honest and say, I don't know enough about how those chemicals differ. I think there's still a lot of research that has to be done in that. Um, to be safe, a lot of times, if I can go with the ecotypic native, I will for that reason, just because I don't know. So safe, rather safe than sorry, but I think it's a great field for research. Hint, hint. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you.